Okay, it seems we still have some technical issues as my camera is not really working, but nevertheless, I guess it's a too important topic to, um, to be stopped by this. So I will just introduce myself and then we'll start with the presentation. So my video camera is not working, but nevertheless, I hope you can hear me very well. And afterwards, um, you can see as well the presentation. So my name is Marie-Claire Graf. I'm from Switzerland and I, was, um, I joined the Global Youth Summit two years ago and um, I'm very, very active in the field of sustainability, as, um, especially in the field of climate. Um, and so I'm doing a lot of local initiatives um, here in Switzerland and in Zurich. I'm also very involved in the national as well as international um, actions and negotiations. And what I face every day is that people are aware of climate change they know that it's also man-made and that we are responsible and that we have to come up with action. But what people mostly don't really understand is about the urgency. So that we have only a very, very small window of opportunity left. And I guess this is what I um, would like to address in this, in this webinar. And also what I try to give to you, that you can use it as multiplicator, that you can go um, and talk to your friends, to your family, um, to your university or your business or wherever you are, um, and that you can show this to people that it's not only about climate change and it's about that it's man-made, but that it's a climate disaster, it's a climate crisis, and the window of opportunity, the window of action is closing very, very rapidly. So let me try if I can sh share my screen and if you can see then as well my slides. So it looks like it's working. So this was the picture, the first picture where you can see the, the earth very fully illuminated. And it was the first picture humanity ever saw. And I guess this was very crucial that we all understood that we are all together um, on this planet and that's our common home and that we only have this common home and we have to protect it. So it was from the Apollo mission um, um, back in the, in, the, in the 60s. And we could also see that we have a huge impact on our planet. And so the only questions which are remaining are for this crisis, must we change? Is there this urgency some people talk about? Then can we still change it? Or maybe it's not maybe it's not even possible anymore. And the last question I would like to address is, will we change? So the very first question is, is must we change? And I guess there is scientific, enough scientific evidence which shows that there is a very clear answer to this, but let me state it a little bit more. So many people think that the sky is a vast and limitless space and um, you can just dump there whatever you want but in fact if you look up you can see here the atmosphere and it's so thin it's so small and that's where we all put um, a lot of um, pollution inside and that's why we're going to destroy the ratio the very it's very um, special ratio in this atmosphere which is actually making it possible that we have life on earth and to this very very thin layer which you can see here in blue we are dumping um, 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution um, every 24 hours. So it's like a huge number and no one can really realize how much this is, but it's the fact it's just way too much. Um, and this is then leading to what we call the um, greenhouse effect. And I'm just going very shortly to explain that this is like super crucial and um, most people somehow know how it is. So if this is repetition, just listen to it quickly again. So we have, um, here we have solar radiation, which is coming from the sun directly. And then it's going to pass this thin layer of the atmosphere, which you saw before. Um, some of the, of the waves are passing it, and some of them are coming to the earth and make life as we know it today possible. Um, then it's go, it will be reflected, as you can see here, um, in longer waves back through the atmosphere. And most of them are actually going to spread. Some of them, as you can see here, are actually, um, again, reflected from the atmosphere 
back to the earth and this makes it possible for humanity to live here and makes it like you have an average temperature of 15 degrees which is very comfortable for us um, to live so this is very normal this is absolutely crucial for humanity um, because otherwise there would not there would not be life on earth so it would be like on the moon where it's like minus 160 degrees during night and plus 150 or 60 degrees in um, during daytime so this atmosphere is super super crucial and it's very important that we have it but what is happening that we put as mentioned before, 110 million tons of global warming pollution into this atmosphere and therefore the CO2 concentration is increasing and more and more of these waves, as you can see here, are trapped within the atmosphere and the earth. And this is what we call the greenhouse effect and what is going, what is causing global warming. And this is the very crucial, um, very crucial to understand when we talk about climate change that we know how this is working on the scientific level. So most people then ask like where is this uh, man-made pollution coming from and there are a lot of different um, sources of this man-made global warming pollution so mostly it's, it's coming from agricultural practices so mostly from livestock as you can see here um, it's coming from forest burning, also from transportation. Aviation is the most polluting means of transportation, but there are also a lot of factories, as you can see here, um, or also from landfills. So there are like a lot of different sources um, which are leading to this um, greenhouse um, concentration we have today in the atmosphere. So why is this in itself a problem? And I guess this graph is very crucial to understand. So we have here in the x-axis, we have like the years from 1850 up to 216 or up to now. And on the um, y-axis, we have um, the carbon concentration, the CN2 concentration. And as you can see in the beginning, it was not growing a lot, but then in, after the 1950, after the Second World War, you can see a rapid acceleration and increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, you cannot, you can see that here, yeah, we thought that's maybe being stabilized, but unfortunately it's not. 2018 and 2019 um, will be again um, the year with the, with the most CO2 concentration, so in fact, um, some days ago, over 4,026 parts per million were hit, so it's like the highest CO2 concentration which we ever measured on this planet. So let me show why this is important. Okay, now we know where the CO2 is coming from. We know that it can be a problem because of the um, greenhouse effect. But this is what mostly people know, that the global surface temperature is changing a lot. So before we had like the CO2 concentration from 1950, so it started a little bit earlier, and then you saw this rapid increase. And I was pointing out 1950, where you can really see that the change is accelerating. And this is what you can show in this graph as well, the correlation between the temperature as well as the CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere. Because here, after 1950, or even some years before, you can see there is still a time warmer years and have like hotter and colder years but then here you can see there are like only hotter years than measured in average and you can see there is no colder year so that you can really see that there was a big change and that it's not exactly the right time is because um, natural ecosystems and processes are very slow in adapting that's also like a problem we will talk about later on but it's very crucial to see that what the pollution which is out there is going to impact the temperature maybe not that exactly at the same year but in the longer um in the longer transition you really see that an increase in co2 in the atmosphere is going to lead to a um, increase in temperature <coughs> it's also very important to say that um here we have like the global surface temperature um so there can be some places on earth where it's maybe stable or it's even decreasing but the global surface temperature is rising and is still rising, as we can see very clearly on this slide. So this is actually a slide um, from last year. Today we would say 17 out of the 18 hottest years on the records have occurred since 2001. 
So we can clearly see that the hottest years ever measured were within this, this last years where we could see an absolutely um, big increase in temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere. 2016 was the hottest year measured in 2017. 2017 was even hotter. 2018 was a little bit less hot, but would still contribute to the hottest year ever measured. And 2019 will maybe hit again a record, a very unfortunate record, but will be then again be the hottest year ever measured on the planet. So now you ask, why is this so important? Why is this a huge crisis we are facing? And um, as you can see here, so a lot of people where I live here in, in, in Western Europe and Switzerland say like, yeah, it's not that it's not that important because it's, it's actually quite good if it's getting a little bit warmer. Um, but this lead here where I live to, um, to to serious problems when it comes to health, health effects for for people, for animals, but also for our crops, for the weather, for for elderly and, and young and young people people so during the last heat wave in 2015 over 3,000 um, 300,000 additional deaths were actually um, registered only here in Western Europe and I guess it's very important when we talk to people that it's not only the islands somewhere in the Pacific which are facing the crisis it's like here and yet yet at the moment we are we are facing all these bad effects of climate change of the climate crisis already as well as very important to see because it's also like very prominent in the news that the global oceans are also heating up. So we have a graph here since the 2015, you can see this rapid um, increase of temperature and you may ask yourself why this is important. And this is important because of the hurricanes, because hurricanes can only um, occur if they have um, a certain temperature um, of the water, so it's around 26 degrees. And when the oceans are getting hotter, there are more hurricanes. That's why on this picture you can see four hurricanes at one time, and this just never happened before. Scientists didn't even think that this can happen. And um, so there were also like huge hurricanes where, which were never seen before in history. So scientists couldn't even give, um, couldn't even if, uh, give some models how this will hit the land or what can happen because it just came so rapidly because the ocean water was so warm that they could just suck up so much water and they were so strong that scientists couldn't give any um, recommendation to people live on the coast. Um, they didn't even expect that something like this can happen. So this is another effect um, coming with the climate crisis as well the climate um, crisis is interrupting the water cycle. So we have, as you know, water running to the sea, like to small rivers, um, then we have the evaporation, and then it's going to the atmosphere, and then we have coming down as rain again. And unfortunately, um, there are places on the roof which are getting a lot more water, especially in, like in a very short amount of time, and other places, they're actually facing droughts. And this is also an effect of climate. Obviously, there is still the same amount of water, but the distribution is very different. And this is a huge problem, as you can see on the next picture. So these are so-called rain bombs. And this is also a very new um, phenomenon that on some parts, some regions of the world, they have like so much water coming out of these bombs. And it just destroys everything, um, as you can see then on the next picture. And this was also science could not predict because they were aware that something like this can happen. So we have like this extreme um, rainfalls, we have all these extreme weather elements, um, and there will be even increased through the climate crisis. So here you can see a picture from 2015, December in India, um, and this rain, they have like rain, but it never occurred so um, such a such an amount um, that everything was flooded and people couldn't even flee because it came so so quickly. So as I was mentioning before, the heat we have it's obviously extracting um, a lot of water from the oceans, which are then leading to weather um, extremes like hurricanes or tsunami or tornadoes. But the same um, heat is also is also extracting a lot of water from the land. 
So that's why we have a huge problem with desertification. So areas which still had enough water, at least at some times during the year, are now facing droughts. Farmers cannot produce um, crops anymore. Their um, soil will be longer and they have like longer and deeper droughts, which, which can be very ex existential. So that farmers, they have to move, especially when they have like livestock sheep and cows and they cannot find any any grass anymore so this is also something um, about this extra heat so you see like the curve which I showed before CO2 is going up it's going up and now there are like a lot of different um, effects coming out of this heating which is all which is all part of the climate crisis so it's like just one picture I could show you like hundreds of pictures um, this is in, in Brazil and during this time it was not it's not supposed to be that dry in this area and you can see that the, the lake is very small and a lot of farmers are actually around there have to feed their cows feed their cows and bring water to their fields and this was just not possible anymore also when it's getting hotter um, what we could also see for example in san francisco or even here in the north in western europe for example in norway it's not supposed to have um, uh, forest fires but you can very clearly see like an orange the temperature rise and relation between temperature rise as well as the um, forest fires and you can see the huge increase um, and I guess like it's, very, it's best to just show some pictures. So there's like in Canada, as well as Canada, it's not supposed to have um, forest fires there, as well in Switzerland or in Norway or in San Francisco. People are not ready. Ready, there were like a lot of losses and damages to flee because everything burned down. You can see cars are stuck in the train on the street also the problem which is coming with climate change. So these are all weather extremes and as you can increase not over the last years. So you can see mostly like typhoons and tsunamis and, um, and also thunderstorms. Then we have in blue the floods. As well here, um, floods are occurring in places where researchers didn't think of because it's just, it just never happened like this. And the same we have in the red, where you can see extreme temperatures, droughts, and fires um, as well there. So no one expected that in Norway, they have like 15 um, forest fires. They're like, we are facing a completely um, new reality. As probably most um, people are aware that the glaciers are melting. And just very recently, there was a study that the Greenland ice field um, shield is will be melting and regardless what we are doing now to stop the CO2 concentration, Greenland will lose all its ice um, because as I was mentioning before, we have this cycle and they are actually quite slow. So even if we stop CO2 now, it's still going to be warmer. And um, that's why in the in Southwest Greenland, the, the ice shield will be melting nevertheless. Um, a lot of studies on the ice shields, and they can you can see from like the last um, of the last years how it's um, decreasing very rapidly. This is the same picture, 70 years later, and I guess it's very alarming to see here 1935, where you can still see there is um, ice, and now exactly the same picture in summer. Um, 2013, where you can see we have only some ice left here on the sides or up here. This ice is going to melt anyway, so we cannot stop and protect um, this area anymore. So a lot of species will go to be extinct, um, people who live there. But more important, just the whole ecosystem is going to be changed, which has a huge effect on global temperature, on global weather um, patterns and so on. So here you see the curve of the um, this lining ice mass in Greenland. And as I was just mentioning, um, there is no hope for Greenland on ice anymore. So either we or the next generation
can never see these eyes anymore. And I guess this is something really shocking because regardless what we are doing, it's too late for Greenland already. Um, but also, as maybe you saw in, in, the, in the news, um, Florida, for example, they were facing um, floods in, in September 2015. So the streets and the shops were all flooded. Um, sometimes kids could not go to school anymore. And um, they also faced quite a lot, um, a huge um, economic loss because people had to stay at home, have had to fix their houses and so on. So this was in Florida, but you could, say, could see the same in New York and, and places all over the world because most of the cities, especially the big cities, are quite close to the coast, which are then facing um, these weather extremes and floods even more. As you can see here, um, we have the 10 cities ranked um, from sea level rise in 2017. So we have Miami. Um, it's on the left, on the left, you see the, um, the assets. So how much worth the city actually has. You can see um, Miami, um, Guangzhou, New York, and so on. So this, um, these 10 cities are at ex existential risk um, to be um, watered um, by 2070. So it's still within um, a young person lifespan. Um, and the cities, they may can prevent their cities with walls or other um, technological um, innovations, but probably they have to move. So they have to move the whole city to areas which are like higher up. And this will be extremely cost incentive. Very interesting. Here you see the top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise, but um, in regard of their population. So um, Kolkata, Mumbai, Dhaka, and so on. So even here we have up to 14 million um, people living in, in, in the cities. And I guess this also caused a lot of social disasters. So until now, we only talked about the environmental aspects of it. But if you have to imagine that all these people have to move, where do they go? Who is going to pay for them? Who is ensuring that they have a decent life? Who is going to ensure that they have a house anymore? at their new place and so on. So it's very, very crucial um, to also incorporate from the very beginning on the social aspects. Um, as you can see here, we're like the 10 biggest cities which are under risk of sea level rise by 2070. And it's very important um, to see that not only climate, sci climate scientists are talking about climate change and see it as a huge problem, but as well, so this is um, a statement from the US Dep um, Department of Defense, um, that they actually say that climate change will likely lead to food and water shortages, um, pandemic diseases, and will also cause um, refugees and um, natural disasters in many regions across the globe. So this was not a scientist studying climate science um, came up with a statement, but this was the US Department of Defense. So they see this crisis as well as a crisis for food and water, for basic human needs, but also in the health aspect, so with pandemic as diseases, but also on a very social level with refugees. Um, but as well, we have like the natural disaster, um, biodiversity here. Um, so heat stress um, will, ha will lead to a lot of problems. Um, for the crops because they didn't grow in these conditions, so they are not there or not, or they are like very sensitive to to the heat. So then, as you can see on the picture, so they just don't grow, um, or there is like a water shortage, as I was mentioned before, and this will as well lead to a lot of social social um, unrest. Um, because when they have like a lot of, of shortage in food, this will then lead to extreme prices and a lot of farmers cannot pay this anymore. So it's very crucial to think, to think about this um, food aspect when we talk about climate change. Um, as well, climate change is a medical emergency. 
as well. This is not coming from um, from climate scientists, but this is coming from from uh, for example from the UN um, World Health um, Organization, where they say we have to treat the climate change as a crisis because it's a medical emergency. As you can best see here, that a lot of tropical um, diseases are moving a lot. So first they were only occurring in some places in the south, and now due to this expansion of temperature, um, they, they actually like spread all over the world, and this makes it much harder to treat all of this um, all of these diseases. So you can see here, like in um, in blue, the Rift Valley fever. You can see the Zika. Um, virus and, and pink because we talked a lot about this recently we can see the dengue fever and so on so there are a lot of diseases which are now due or rift because of climate change are spread all over the world so like yeah most probably you heard about the Zika virus and climate change helped them a lot to spread all over the world and give them some new habitats but as well so we don't only have species who are like actually like um, endangering us but we are in the middle of the sixth mass extinction so we lose up to 200 species every day and um, one million species are endangered and we are going probably to lose them um, in the next years and also 50 percent of all land-based species are under risk and we are going to lose them probably by the end of the century so you can may ask yourself like why this is important um, and why this should affect us. So beside that, it's the beauty of nature that we have all these species and they are working all together. Um, all these species are very crucial for a human survivor um, because they are crucial in our food production, they are crucial for our health, they are crucial for the whole ecosystem, how it's working, and we depend on them. Um, and there's just no other way around that, um, that if you're going to lose them, it will f sooner or further also treat humanity itself. So now we talked a lot about different effects of, of the climate crisis. Um, and I just want to show that there are like many more aspects. I cannot mention all of them, but the costs of, of climate change is affecting um, political stability. So it will increase instability, especially in regions which are already unstable yet. Obviously, it will cause a lot of floods, wild, wildfires, droughts. Um, it will trigger a lot of storm, especially um, cities which are close to the coast. Um, also, something I didn't mention a lot, but um, it's ocean acidification. So a lot of animals which are in the oceans are actually going to die um, because the oceans are getting more acid. Um, so their, sh their um, shell is just going to dissolve. As I was mentioning, it's causing climate refugees, even if, there, if, even if there is not a term yet created, but it's a huge problem because some islands will just disappear. A lot of coastal areas will just disappear and no one knows how to deal with it. As I was mentioning, um, we, are, we are in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. We are losing species. And we have melting glaciers. Um, there is also again like the, the food shortage, we have like water scarcity, we are losing whole ecosystems before we even discover them. So a lot of species are actually not yet discovered, but they are already extinct. So we also lose a lot of um, inspiration. Maybe they're like, maybe they... And we will never get them back. But also just our way of life. So we don't have all the freedom to enjoy it. Yeah. At the moment, and we enjoyed in the last years, which, as I was talking about, infectious diseases um, and yeah, sea level rise. Um, still, maybe this is all um, this is all like science as a climate scientist, but it's very important to see that. Even from the economic side. They state where this is our biggest crisis, and we have to act accordingly. I guess the question is very clear, and it's a very, very bold yes. 
not only from the climate scientists, um, but as well from, from, from the private sector, as well from the banking sector, as well from ordinary people like you and me. So then we are coming to the second question. Um, can we change? Because there are some people, they say that there is no possibility um, that we can change anymore. So, but I guess it's very important to talk about the second question, can we change? So here we have all in our hands. There are a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, solutions to a lot of different problems. And I can really recommend you to, lead, to read the book or to check out the book, Draw Down. They present 100 actions to either reverse global warming. It's very comprehensive and very scientific. So we sh researchers all over the world worked very hard together to come up with all these solutions. The solutions are not new, um, but nevertheless, it's very good that we have them all at one page. As you can see, for example, here um, in the energy sector, which is contributing a lot to global warming, um, there were projections to back in 2000, and um, the projections by, um, in this case, about 16 um, times. So you can see here. Um, where we cannot stop it anymore, regardless of what it is. Globally, it um, could actually supply our whole um, electricity. Energy is like, will, would be sufficient enough to. Um, to supply all, all our as not always windy, but there are other solutions. As we can see from the from the solar energy, and as well here, there are like projections back in two thousand and two um, that the solar market will obviously grow by one gigawatt um, per year by twenty ten. But as well, this um, was hit by seventeen times. So you can really see that the projections not that long ago. Um, are now they are like super outdated and we can move much faster so there is a lot of hope and in some um, in some cases in some um, countries even exceed five times so it's now in this rapid growth and there is no way how we can actually stop this as you can see here the graphs very encouraging to see the worldwide uh, photovoltaic installations. Why was this possible? Um, obviously because the cost came down, so at the moment it's cheaper to um, get electricity from, from solar and wind than from coal and oil and um, nuclear. So even on a very economic, very economic decision, um, it's just ridiculous to invest in oil because the the dollar per watt or per gigawatt is just simply it's just simply cheaper and therefore more economic to invest in renewable energies. As well, you can see here, um, a lot of people actually got access to energy only because of solar power because there was electric grid, um, and this is also not. But we can really leapfrog now. Um, with new, um, with new uh, renewable energies, what was not possible with um, electric uh, power plant. Um, maybe like some, some leading. So in Chile, um, the solar market back in. We had like 11 megawatts. Then you could already see that in, in um, end of um, year. Eight hundred and eighty-four um, megawatts. But what is really really encouraging to see that now. So we have the same graph. 
here before end of 2015 and now this is end of 2016 um, where they have like 13.3 um, gigawatt of solar energy um, approved or under construction and I guess now it's even more you can really see that this change is is coming and it, you cannot stop it anymore so it's really really encouraging to see the example for example um, in Chile as well maybe you heard about this number so the solar energy which is reaching the earth every hour is actually enough to um, supply the world's energy demand for a full year obviously we cannot put everywhere solar um, how, um, solar um, panels, but it's very encouraging to see that we have enough endless energy coming from the sun. We just have to take it and use it. Um, and then we have like fully CO2 neutral energy. Um, here you see um, the US energy storage market, because as I was mentioning before, um, energy coming from wind as well as solar is very unstable so during night or some periods there is no wind there is no sun um, but you can see that the storages are getting better and better so you can see on the left side um, how much they can actually store as well they are getting much cheaper so people can afford it for their own homes and make this is a really game changer because if we can store it um, and we can get, actually have it for free from coming from from wind or coming from coming from the sun. Um, then we can really solve all the issues around um, electricity, as well as maybe it's just like a like, so short example. But LED, like the the lights, which are using um, less energy, like ninety percent less energy, as well as they they are getting better, and more and more people um, are actually buying them. So it's also very encouraging to see as well as car factory, um, factories, they are moving very, very rapidly. Um, so they are, they are now going to do research on electric vehicles and they are not um, following the combustions anymore. So we have like obviously Tesla, but also Toyota, Benz and a lot of other um, companies which are now really focusing on, on electric vehicles, not because they wanna be green, but because it's the new normal and because they saw that there is no other way. So I guess the second question, can we change, is also very clear. Yes, we can change. There are like hundreds and thousands of solutions out there. We just have to take them, and which is leading to the third question, will we change? And I guess this is the most tricky one. Um, but first I would like to say that in, back in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement and um, all nations around the world agreed on working together to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions that we prevent um, global, that we prevent like disaster and stop global warming um, to two degrees um, and focusing or aiming for 1.5 degrees. Um, maybe just a short input, why two degrees or 1.5? Because scientists could find out that when we are passing two or 1.5 degrees, some irreversible changes are coming to happen. And the only way to, um, to stop this is like to keep, it, to keep temperature below 1.5 or two degrees. And um, this is a picture from 2017, but also like today, it's very timely. Today is the second international um, climate strike. Um, there are like over 5,000 um, strikes registered all around the world. We could also see like back in 2017, people are marching <clears throat> in front um, here in, in Washington DC, in front of the White House, um, demanding climate action. Also today there, I will show you afterwards some pictures. Encouraging to see that we have all the solutions, we have a global agreement, um, we have a lot of climate action plans on the national level, so we have everything to actually go on this change. So this again, is very encouraging and will lead to um, the second part of the presentation. So will we change? Yes, we will change. And we have to use our, our voices. We have to use our votes and our choices every, every day to fight the climate crisis all together, encourage, encourage ourselves um, to go on and do even bolder um, commitments and action. Um, so this presentation um, was, is also given by Al Gore. 
I was part of the um, climate reality, which is an NGO led by Al Gore. Um, they are training um, ordinary people um, to talk about the crisis and spread the word. And I can really encourage you also to take part in this project. I can also um, send you the links and put it in the bio. But first, I would really like um, to show you as well some other examples because mostly people after this presentation are like, yeah, and what can I do now um, to do something? So I would, I have to change the screen. Um, one second. Okay, why is this now? Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, it should just change, I guess that it's that it's not irreversed, and I don't know why it's actually like this. Um let me find out. Okay, looks like it's working now. Um, so what I would really encourage you, there are like two aspects what you can do to fight the climate crisis first it's increase your handprint i will going to talk about this in a second and decrease your own footprint probably you already heard about your footprint so when you live you have an impact on the environment and this is in the everyday language is called as a footprint and what we have to try to minimize our footprint because at the end of the day we have to be at zero Obviously, there are always some emissions coming from that we are living and that we are breathing, but nature is capable enough to actually convert this again into the natural systems. But we are using just too much carbon at the moment. That's why we have to decrease our footprint. I will give you some inputs about how you can um, decrease your own footprint. Then I would also like to talk about the handprint. The handprint is everything that you can do like with your hands, so about like action. Um, and it's very important that we don't only think like how I can personally decrease my footprint and minimize my impact on the world, but how I can increase my impact in the world in a good way. So first, I guess it's very important to understand where um, your bad impact actually on the planet is coming from. So there are a lot of different calculators which you can find online. So ecological footprint or CO2 footprint, there will be like a lot of questions and then yeah, answer them, hopefully. Um, you, you will have like the right answers, otherwise you can also do some estimations. Um, and then they will show you at the end like how many Earths you would use if all people around the planet would live like you. So I did this as well and it was like around um, 3.5 planets or something, which just says that like, everyone around the world would live with the same standards I have and I try to be quite, yeah, I'm quite ecological conscious, so I try to minimize my impact on the world, but nevertheless, I'm still, or like if everyone would live like me, you would still use like 3.5 planet. And it is obviously not going to work as we have only one planet. So first, it's very crucial to understand where your um, environmental impact is coming from. <coughs> then there are a lot of different ways how you can reduce your CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. So mostly you are aware of like light bulbs that was showing before, or um, don't do um, don't use the drying machine for the laundries or recycling. These are all these small actions. You can see they have an impact, but it's also very important when we talk about about uh, reducing CO2 that we actually targeting um, some other aspects, as for example, um, don't use a car or switch to um, more like electric cars, very important that the electricity is not coming from a coal plant, otherwise it's very useless to switch to an electric car. 
as well as the diet has a huge impact. So vegetarian or vegan diets, um, they are going drastically to reduce your own footprint and also increase your health. So like it's a good um, side aspect about it. As well like green energy, I was talking before. Um, very important, the next one. So flying is the um, action, human action, which are causing the most CO2 emissions. And very important maybe to say here as well, that only 3% of of humanity ever took a plane um, and so like a lot of people say like oh if you make um, planes more expensive so this would be this would lead to some social um, this would be like socially unfair um, and I guess like it's just very impressive to show that only three percent of population ever took a plane so if we say that it's socially unfair to not fly anymore um, it's actually it's just very ridiculous to argue like this if 97% um, of humanity never took a plane. Um, the next one as well, don't use a car. I know like in certain places around the world, um, the public transportation system is not that good, but nevertheless, I guess it's, it's, it's very important to consider it, especially in places where it's possible to not use car anymore. The one with the most impact, having um, one um, child less or having um, less kids is obviously um, a huge topic to talk about. Um, but nevertheless, I guess it's very important to see that population growth itself is is very unstable, especially at the, at the rate we have it at the moment. But I don't want to go into this discussion, but we can have a very philo philosophical discussion about this. So um, very easy, I guess, when you want to start something, um, something you can do very quickly is about checking your food options. So um, first, like reduce your food waste, this should not harm anyone. Um, eat less than animal products in general, um, which is equal to going um, vegetarian, so means no meat, and going for vegan, um, so you don't use animal products in general anymore. As well, it's important to always check if what you're buying is season, seasonal and regional. I know sometimes it's like very, very hard, and you're like in a food um, shop, and there are like so many options, you don't really know where it's coming from, but they're also like marker. Um, farmers um, markets and other places. I guess it's it's coming in a lot of different places, but it's it's up, it's absolutely worth checking out. Like where you have um, the options to buy more um, seasonal and regional food as well. Um, comes with like the packaging. Um, the packaging itself is also responsible for um, for CO2 emissions as well as for environmental destruction. So try whenever to um, use to go to zero waste jobs, as you can see, for example, on the left side. Um, when it comes to consumption, um, this is also like a huge factor. And I'm not saying that we should stop consuming, even if this will probably be the best for the planet and we probably have all um, goods and gadgets is on the world which we need. But it's just very crucial to always consider whenever you try, when you ever consume something to really think, do I really need this? Can I use what I already have? Maybe my friends have something, maybe I can borrow it. Maybe I can exchange with some other people. Um, maybe I can go to a second hand or thrift shop. Maybe I can do it by myself. And if I have to answer all these questions by no, which is barely actually um, the case, then you buy it and then really invest in the good product, which is um, lost for very long. And I guess if we just all very simply ask this, um, these questions bef before we consume something, we could reduce so many, um, unless, um, so, so many um, products we are consuming just because we always did it. We don't even think about it. And it, at the end, you can also save money. So it's also like something very positive for your um, for your wallet. As was mentioning before, flying is the action, the most um, environmental bad impact in that action you can do as an individual. Um, so try um, obviously not to fly. For example, in, in Europe, I'm not flying anymore. So I was traveling to 24 countries for the, for the European Union and for the U United Nations last year for projects, everything by train and by bus. Um, and it's possible. Um, even like taking a train and bus 50 hours to go to Turkey, it is possible, obviously it needs time, but this will be the new reality because we can just not afford to fly as much as we're doing because at the moment flying is contributing to 2% of, um, 
of um, global emissions, and this is just way too much. So we have to stop flying, um, especially whenever it's like very easily. Um, you can just take a train, or um, sometimes it's not even um, yeah, it's not even um, necessary to fly somewhere. As I was already mentioning, use public transportation whenever possible. Um, because public transportation is using um, way less energy than the individual cars. But now let me quickly go to the um, to the handprint. So what can you do? And I guess first it's very very important to inform your friends, um, because most people know about climate change. They know that somehow humans are involved and in causing climate change, and they maybe also know some of the actions they could do. But I guess it's very very crucial to really say that we are in an urgency, that we have a climate crisis, and um, we have to be very explicit about this language, and that's why we should all use our social media. We can also use traditional media, like television, radio, newspapers, obviously, um, but I guess it's like something everyone can do. Use their social media to show what is happening, um, show about, show like floods are causing um, problems show that um, how nature is affected, show how you are actually leading the change and that you are taking a train that, um, that you are not, that you are fixing your product. So try to make it cooler, make it more sexy that, um, that all, this, all these actions which you're doing that promote these actions that others will follow a more sustainable lifestyle. So the first action you can do for your handprint is using your um, social media presence or also your media presence in TV and television and with all your projects to stand up and speak up for, for, for the change. As well as something which is maybe rather unknown that um, very key is, is the finance. So if there is enough finance going to unsustainable um, projects like coal mines and oil explorations and so on, this will obviously continue. But as soon as we stop all these finances going in this direction, um, then there is no money left to build like coal mines and so on. So it's very important to yeah, actually put the money or invest the money um, where your values are. And I hope they are um, more sustainable than probably the investments. I don't have a lot of money, but what I did um, to um, really have a change in this direction. So I talk about this with all my family members. I talk about this with the university I'm going. I talk um, about this um, to the canton, so like something like the States. Um, because um, for Switzerland, uh, Twenty times higher than what from very old fashioned fossil fuels to renewable energy. International climate strike over five thousand places. Make their voice heard. CDP is um, very. Yeah, their power and stroll around the world and ask for declaration of climate emergency that um, that change is can actually enter um, because there are a lot of very good examples already existing i was mentioning before what is happening is that it's getting blocked and it cannot enter uh, politics but also in the private sector so it's very very crucial that um that through this climate emergency declaration all the solutions can actually find its way into the implementation phase and that we all together then can really change something. So today, like the um, second international um, climate strikes, so you can see it here, there will be a lot of other climate strike, strikes happening in the, in the future. So I can only encourage you to organize a strike by yourself, join the strikes which are already existing, also coordinate on an international level, get in touch with other strikers all over the world. Um, I guess it's really, really important, and the climate strike itself is an amazing tool 
to trigger all the solutions and implement all the solutions which we already have. Um, at least we here in Switzerland could already achieve a lot with the climate strikes. And I really hope that um, the climate strikes are bringing the, this last um, motivation, this piece which was missing until now, that we really can transform society, um, businesses, um, how everything is working. Um, for everyone who has the right to vote, um, I would really encourage you to get active in politics. Politics is not always good, but it's also up to us to not leave this amazing opportunity to old people yeah. who don't vote in favor of our future. Um, so there is like active and passive um, engagement in politics. So either you can vote, but you can also um, yourself be a politician, I guess, like a lot of global change makers will be amazing politicians. And that's why I really um, encourage you to get active in politics, but also get active in your institutions um, and really be the change you wish to see in the world. And while being a politici politician, you can influence regulations and setting new standards so that the new normal is not is not like this old fashioned um, fossil fuel industry anymore. But then we have like this flexible smart, um, we have like the innovation, we have the social changes, we have um, a new world and we have new values. And I guess this is really, really important, um, really, really important to consider that you can also have like a huge impact on the world, which is good, while trying to minimize your own impact. So these are um, a lot of ideas from my side now. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out um, to me. I am like eager to support you along the way. And I would like really thank you for everything. Um, for listening and um, that we can stay in, in contact and um, yeah, really um, trigger this change even more because it's absolutely crucial that young people are leading the change because the older ones were waiting for too long and now it's up to us to wake them up and be the change. Thank you so much and bye-bye.